So, so we are very honored to have Sarah Owens here. And I feel like at this point, she is a friend because she has presented so much for us. And we just love her presentations each and every time. Sarah is a full-time early childhood education instructor for Penn Foster College, and she's currently working to complete her master's degree in education. She has experience in early childhood settings, as well as special education programs and classrooms, where she's worked to develop her skills in classroom management, lesson plan development, and differentiated instruction. We know she has presented on numerous topics related to early childhood education over the last seven years, and we are just thrilled to have her here today to share some exciting new knowledge about moving and grooving for more successful learning. Sarah, the floor is yours. Sarah, let's just do a quick sound check because we're not able to hear you. They're very low. Are you able to turn your volume up? No, it is not. Nope. Give that a try, Sarah. Is that better? It is, it sure is. Okay, I apologize for that. Um, always try to be prepared, but sometimes things go wrong. Totally understand so technology. You sound great. The floor is yours, Sarah. Okay, thanks. And I'm really excited to be here. I always love presenting at this conference and we always have a lot of fun. Um, and I just wanted to share some information that I've learned over the last few years on moving and grooving for more successful learning. So we're going to start off by kind of just reintroducing me. Um, as Stephanie said, I am a full-time instructor at Penn Foster College, and I've been doing that for about seven years. Uh, but in addition to that, I'm also a preschool teacher. I am a PD specialist for the Council for Professional Recognition, and I have educational background and experience in special education. You'll also see later on in my session that I am a Pinterest enthusiast. I promote Pinterest in most of my sessions because it's such an excellent resource. And in addition to all of that, I'm also a kinesthetic learner. And so some of you may be asking yourselves, what is a kinesthetic learner? What does that really mean? Others may be thinking that you already know what a kinesthetic learner is and how to use strategies that would best meet those learners' needs, and that's great. I always thought I knew a lot about kinesthetic learners and how to support them too, until I took a course a couple of years ago called the Kinesthetic Classroom um, and using movement as a teaching and learning tool. And I've always incorporated kinesthetics into my teaching practices because that's how I learn best, but it really can be a, a great resource and tool for you to use in your um, teaching practices. And so the course really provided me with so much more information on the purposes of movement and the brain body connection, which is what I really want to share with all of you today. So most, if not all of you are probably familiar with Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, which you can see on the screen here. And the kinesthetic learner is one of the eight intelligences outlined in his theory. The other seven include interpersonal, verbal linguistic, logical mathematical, naturalistic, intrapersonal, visual spatial, and musical. We also know that there are a few other intelligences out there such as existential, spiritual, and moral, but they're not included or incorporated into his original theory. So you might be looking at this image and thinking that you feel like you fit into multiple areas here, and that's perfectly fine. Um, that's actually very common. And Gardner's theory outlines that there are different types of intelligences, that each person has strengths in different areas for how they learn and process information best. So for example, I told you that I'm a kinesthetic learner. So I know for myself that I learn best when I'm actively engaged in learning with my hands and my body or by incorporating movements into my study practices. Um, I also strongly relate to being a visual learner. 
meaning that I have to see the information in order to grasp it and understand it. And then I also have strengths in the logical mathematical learning area, which means that concepts revolving around math and logical thinking, they just come more easily to me and they make more sense to me than some other areas. But I also understand as a learner, my weaknesses. So when it comes to learning information, I'm not a strong verbal linguistic learner. Um, if someone was to provide a lecture to me or just try to explain something to me verbally, I have a really hard time following that and comprehending that information. Um, and so it's really important as an educator to not only know what your strengths are as a learner, but also what your weaknesses are and to have a good understanding of the theory of multiple intelligences so that you can make sure you're meeting the needs of all of the children you're working with. So I'd like to just pause for a moment and you don't have to put it into the chat box. Please feel free to do if you'd like to, um, but just think about for a minute, which of the eight types of intelligences best describe you as a learner? If you reflect on that, is it just one of them? Is it multiple, multiple pieces of that theory? Um, which ones best describe you as a learner? And that's great. Somebody shared that they're a visual learner, lots of visual learners. I tend to find that in early childhood, especially, a lot of us are more visual, kinesthetic. Uh, we like to use a lot of images and imagery to teach and also movement. Um, and so I always like to ask this question and kind of see what other early childhood educators or educators in general feel that they um, they fit best into. So thank you for sharing that information with me. And so I've already kind of discussed that a kinesthetic learner is body smart. Um, and this means that a kinesthetic learner best learns through hands-on activities and exploring their environments. But it also means that kinesthetic learners um, learn best when they actively and physically engage their bodies and senses in the learning process. So you wanna take this picture for example. Um, this teacher in this image, she's teaching the directions over, under, through, left, right, through physical movements. She could have easily taught this concept with inanimate objects. I know I've done it a hundred times before and just showing the children what over and under mean and having them practice with those objects. But in state, instead, she chose to physically engage the children with their bodies in that learning process and has allowed them to act out each of the directions. This is then going to allow the children to better retain the information because their body is giving them a more concrete way to process the information. And then in turn, they're going to be storing that information into their memory. And this is really the brain-body connection. So the brain-body connection is that direct link between the brain's ability to process and comprehend information and the use of the body and senses. And we really need to take that as a valuable um, piece of the teaching and learning process. So true learning occurs when the body and senses are used in connection with teaching new concepts or even reviewing old concepts. Adding movement to your lessons is going to make them more effective, which will allow you to reach more of your students. And so when we add movement to the teaching learning process, we're fulfilling the brain's basic needs. I don't know if you've ever thought about the fact that the brain does have basic needs, which makes the learning process more effective and re rewarding, not only for you as the teacher, but also for your students. So the brain seeks out specific things that make it easier for it to process, comprehend, and recall information, which are concrete experiences, emotional connections with the learning process, so how are the children feeling about that process and about that activity or that concept, um, variety and newness, so making sure that you're not doing the same things over and over and over again you want to try to provide variety in the way that you're presenting information, the way that you're teaching those different concepts, motivation and concentration. 
social interactions, and a sense of belonging to the classroom community. So we don't always think about all of these things when we're developing our lesson plans, but these are really important uh, needs to keep in mind as you're developing them and making sure that you're meeting the needs of the brain so that the children can actually understand and remember what you're teaching them. Movement is also developmentally appropriate and individually appropriate. So you can easily adapt your movement activities to meet the varying needs of the children in the classroom. But I've also found that if you adopt movement into your teaching practices, you're gonna find that you're reaching more students, especially those who can't always express to you what their learning needs are, especially for those of you who might be working with the very young children, our infants and toddlers, even some of our preschoolers who maybe just don't have the words or the communication skills to express to you what they need, or some children who are more reserved and aren't necessarily making those needs outwardly ob obvious to you. Um, so I'll use my daughter as an example. She's a very reserved child who, even as an infant, was always very aware of people watching her um, and almost of judgment. I've never seen an infant who won't dance to music if other people are looking at her. Um, but that is my daughter. And so she might have specific needs in the teaching learning process, but she's not going to show you those. She's not going to let you see those. And I've come across quite a few children who are like that. They're much quieter, more reserved, and they're not necessarily willing, even when they don't think you're watching, to show you what those needs are. So this can be really helpful. So we've discussed what a kinesthetic learner is, and I think that's pretty simple to understand. We understand that brain-body connection and that you have to incorporate that movement and the senses into your lessons. But what does it mean to develop a kinesthetic classroom? Uh, in a kinesthetic classroom, movement is valued and seen as a tool for learning. Rather than just something you're doing outside or in gym class or at designated gross motor times of the day, if we can change our mindset and look at movement as a tool and a process rather than a burden and just one more thing for us to add to the lesson plan or one more thing for us to do, we're going to be able to reach more of our students and really help them truly learn the information that we're teaching. And that's really our goal. That's what we want to achieve when we're developing lessons, when we're incorporating lessons. So we have to look at movement as an essential part of the process. And as educators, we really have to be open to it in our classrooms. Sometimes we limit ourselves by our own attitudes towards the different things that we need to incorporate or the different things that we need to do because it can become a little bit overwhelming at times. Um, but you just have to be more open-minded to it. A kinesthetic classroom also understands and values the connection that's being made between the brain and the body in the learning process when you're incorporating movement. In our early childhood settings, we're actually really lucky because our learning environments allow for and really support movement much, much more than our school age programs do. And we understand that children really learn best by doing. And so we're creating and implementing activities for learning and developing skills and concepts that encourages that natural learning process. That's really what we're doing in those early childhood settings. And with this understanding, we're gonna better be able to enable our students to process, comprehend, and then later recall the information because we're meeting those, those basic needs of the brain for emotional connections, for providing variety, and those concrete experiences, which are so, so valuable. And I know that teachers in school-age settings also have this understanding, we all do as educators, but they really are oftentimes limited or felt feeling limited by their curriculum requirements outlined by the school district and their learning environment. So, I'm really hoping that if you're working in a school-age setting or you know someone who's working in a school-age setting, that the information I'm sharing today is going to kind of encourage you and help you figure out or get some ideas on how to meet the needs for movement in your classroom settings. 
A kinesthetic classroom is also one that uses movement with specific purposes and goals in mind. So what this means is that in a kinesthetic classroom, we're not just randomly adding movements into the classroom and just hoping for the best or hoping that the students make those connections. We're really using movement and specific movement activities more intentionally and implementing movement to allow students time to process the new information and really make those greater connections within the brain. So we're not just willy nilly incorporating movement just whenever we feel like it, we're really looking at our lessons and determining when is movement needed. And so the next portion of this, of this presentation is really gonna give you ideas on what types of movement you need to use for different times within your lessons because there are actually six purposes of movement in the kinesthetic classroom. Um, and these are outlined actually from a textbook, the kinesthetic classroom, teaching and learning through movement. So each purpose has a different goal in mind. So you wanna think about that as you're inc incorporating movement and looking at the activities I'll be sharing in just a little bit. So the first purpose of movement is to prepare the brain for learning. Um, activities and movements to help prepare the brain for learning can typically be done in one to three minutes. So they're not very time consuming. Um, and they're not expected to be too long. So don't, don't feel overwhelmed by thinking that this is gonna take up a lot of time in your lesson plans. You also think of this as part of your learning routine. In the early childhood classroom, we have routines for everything from washing our hands to get ready to go outside. So just think of preparing the brain as part of your teaching and learning routine. And that'll make it a little bit easier to incorporate. And in order to make our lessons most effective, we have to first prepare the child and their brain to take in that information. So that all makes sense if you really think about it. We have to prepare them for what's coming and so that they're actually going to be able to learn it and retain it. And when we do this, we're gonna help the left and right hemispheres of the brain connect, which is going to then allow more information to be processed and stored. So you wanna think of it similarly to the whole child approach to teaching, but you're addressing the brain. You're addressing the whole brain um, and the whole child at the same time. So our goal is really to reach both sides of the brain together. The second purpose of movement is to provide brain breaks. I know we've all heard about brain breaks. I think I learned about tons of them when I was in school initially. I incorporated brain breaks all the time in my early childhood classroom. I promote the use of brain breaks in my own teaching practices with my students now um, because they're very, very valuable. And activities and movements that provide brain breaks are also very short, typically one to two minutes at tops. Um, and they're, in, they're going to be fun and engaging and provide a much needed break to the child and the child's brain. Um, and when you give them that time, that, that pause, it allows them to process the information that has just been learned and to make way for more information to be learned. So they're very, very valuable. Then the third purpose of movement is to support exercise and fitness. Um, and these activities can be done in three minutes or less typically. They could definitely be longer if you wanted them to, and depending on the type of activity that you decide to incorporate, but they don't have to be very long. Um, and these can be really simple, like jogging in place, or you can make them more complex, like developing an obstacle course or a relay race for your students to complete. Um, and you can come up with movement activities to meet your needs in the classroom while you're improving everyone's overall health and fitness but also instilling positive health, healthy habits in the children and then supporting exercise and fitness will also create and support a positive learning state within your classroom. Um, so this can be really helpful too. If you are in an area like me, I'm in Northeast Pennsylvania, um, where in the winters, it can be very frigid. I know when I was working for Head Start below a certain temperature, we couldn't go outside. And with a classroom full of preschoolers, that gets very difficult. 
So we were constantly coming up with activities and movement activities to incorporate to keep them moving on a daily basis to promote that healthy lifestyle and give them an opportunity to exercise and get that energy out. Then the fourth uh, purpose of movement is to develop class cohesion. And I don't think we always think of movement as being used to develop class cohesion, but it's actually a really great easy way to do that. And movement for developing class cohesion can be used regu regularly as other purposes, um, or it can be used less often, depending on your specific needs. So it can really be used whenever you as the teacher feel it's needed. If the children need to connect again, um, if they're having a difficult time getting along, or I used to use them at the beginning of the year when everyone was getting to know each other or after a long break, like after winter break, we would do some class cohesion activities just to get connected again. And to remember that we are a community within our classroom and that we're all going to work together so some teachers, they choose to have set time periods. I had some set time periods. Others choose to just use them on an as needed basis. And I did that as well. So I would encourage you to kind of do a combination of the two, to have some times when you're going to bring the class together and do these activities for that purpose, but also then kind of gauge, are the children having a difficult time getting along? Do we need to do a movement activity to kind of bring everyone back together? And then the sixth purpose of movement is to teach, I'm sorry, the fifth purpose of movement is to review content. So reviewing content can be made much more fun and engaging and effective through movement. When we use movement to review content, we can provide the brain with time to process the information and to make further and stronger connections. So I've said that a lot throughout this presentation so far. We're making those stronger connections by incorporating the movement. So using it for review is a great time to incorporate that. Um, and they can be as long or as short as you need them to be to review a specific topic because it's probably going to vary depending on what you're reviewing. Um, and these generally include repetition and quick recall, such as reciting the letters and their sounds. You can obviously make them more elaborate if you needed to, depending on, again, on what you're reviewing. And then the sixth and final purpose for movement is teaching content. So when we're teaching content with movement, we're again going to be making more connections between the brain and the information that's being learned. It's also going to help motivate your students to pay attention and really to retain that information because a lot of times they can recall what was the movement or activity I was doing while I was learning and that can help them recall the actual information. And it just makes it more fun and actively engaging for them. Um, like movement activities for reviewing your content, your movement activities for teaching can be as long or as short as you need them to be, depending on the specific information or skill that you're, learn that you're teaching them. Um, and these are really extremely important, but from an educator's perspective, I think they're a lot of times intimidating. We have to make sure that we're using movement to teach content in a way that we're supporting the content, but the movement isn't taking over. What that really means is we don't want the movement activity or the movement portion to become the lesson. We want to just support the children's understanding of the content by incorporating those movement activities. So I completely understand how that gets a little bit overwhelming and intimidating, but I really encourage you all to not be afraid of using movement to teach content. Instead, just embrace it. Make a plan for incorporating it. We know planning is really helpful. It's very important in education. So make a plan. Um, and then you can always start slow and work your way up. Maybe just do one lesson a week with movement and then slowly incorporate more and more as you see how it goes. And don't forget that it's really important to reflect on your practices. So as you are doing the activities, you can evaluate later on, how did that go? What did I need to change? And you can make those adjustments either to that same activity or as you're incorporating more activities into your practices. 
So now we're going to take a look at activities or tools that are going to help you become a kinesthetic educator and use movement to prepare the brain or provide brain breaks or support fitness and exercise class cohesion or reviewing and uh, teaching content. I haven't incorporated a lot of them in here. I have tons more on my Pinterest board, but I wanted to give you some ideas and kind of show you how one activity or idea can really support a lot of those movement purposes. Um, so just keep in mind as we're looking at these activities that most of them can be customized to meet your purpose or goal for movement um, and the specific content you're working with and your age group. And don't feel limited to only use these in the way that I've recommended on the screen. Um, you wanna take a look at the activities and you might have different ideas on how you could incorporate those or use them. So all of the activities I'm gonna be showing you um, are available on Pinterest and they're pinned to my board for the kinesthetic classroom. So I do encourage you all to follow um, me on Pinterest. At, I'm Sarah Jewell um, on Pinterest and I have my link there. I can also send that to you in the chat box at the end of the session. And just know these are not my own personal ideas. Excuse me. Uh, these are instead resources that I found for everyone to use. And then of course, to adapt to your own specific needs. We would never wanna just take the ideas and necessarily take them for what they are. We wanna take those ideas and figure out how can we use those effectively in our classroom and with our specific group of students. So if you're not using Pinterest, I really recommend that you join. It is free and it's an excellent resource for not only connecting and sharing ideas with others in the field, but for finding ideas as well. So the first one um, is from Teachers Pay Teachers, and some of these are from Teachers Pay Teachers, but what I found is that a lot of times you can find the idea. Um, you don't want to copy it, obviously, right from the way that it's developed on Teachers Pay, Pay Teachers, but it just gives you some ideas and of how you could develop tools to incorporate into your classroom um, and what you could do, and you could sometimes um, create them yourself. A lot of things on Teachers Pay Teachers are also free, I find. So you might find free ones. Some of them, they cost typically very little, um, but these are great to print out, laminate, and have on hand for the beginning of the school year. So this one is Mimic, Mimic Me. Um, and they said it was a good transition game, which it definitely can be used for transitions. But I felt that this would be great really for all of the purposes, for preparing the brain, for brain breaks, for fitness and exercise, just to get them up and moving, for class cohesion, because it's just a lot of fun. And then also for reviewing content and teaching content. Maybe you could, you could um, place specific movements with specific pieces of information that you're teaching. This one is um, from Pink Oatmeal and it's alphabet movement cards. And I absolutely love these because it's not only giving the children a movement to go along with each letter and picture, but then you can adapt it and meet the needs of all of your children. Maybe you have some children who are just learning the letters and others who know the letters and are on to move, learning the letter sounds. So you can adapt that and add the letter sounds as you're doing the movements. Um, but I've actually done this with my own child. I have a four-year-old as well. And we've done these and it helped him tremendously when he was much younger in actually remembering the letters. Um, and now we're doing it with the letter sounds and he has almost all of them down. So it is really, really effective. I thought these were great for preparing the brain, brain breaks, and then reviewing content and teaching content like I just explained. Um, this one as well, bugs and insects. I love these and I love the idea of using them with the dice that have the little pocket charts because then you can constantly be rotating them. Maybe you develop new cards for something related to a different theme that you're doing for transportation, let's say, or community workers. And so you can change them out, but keep using that same dice. It's also going to provide the children with more um, variety and newness, like we said, the brain needs and is looking for. Um, 
because you can constantly be changing them out. So it's not the same movements over and over and over again every time you use them. And you can let the children participate. You can even put this in a learning center and let them use them as they like, but then also use them for preparing the brain before a lesson or for brain breaks as you need to. Um, also, have you ever thought about how important it is for crossing the midline? I never really understood. I've heard about crossing the midline. I've read about crossing the midline. But when I took this course, it really solidified how important crossing the midline is and it, that it doesn't necessarily have to just be in exercise movements, that it can be in everyday activities that we're incorporating into our learning centers or then we're using as uh, activities for preparing the brain or brain breaks because we can incorporate a lot of these into our learning centers and have them available for the children to do on a day-to-day -day basis as they like. Um, or we can do them as a group. Like I love this picture at the bottom with the little girl on the scooter using a plunger um, to move. So she's kind of doing that rowing motion back and forth, crossing her midline to move across the floor. Even the little boy who is sorting the animals from into the different baskets, um, I'm sure depending on where they live or some other feature, but he's doing it on an exercise ball where he's having to move from left to right. And so these are really great activities. This resource actually has tons of ideas. I love how we learn um, .com. She always has really great ideas, um, but this is one you could definitely and easily incorporate throughout your classroom. These are some other dice as well um, that you could create. It's a little bit difficult to laminate ones like this, but you could probably create them out of uh, cardboard or something a little bit sturdier than paper so that they last longer for you. Um, but these give different movements and different body parts to do that movement with. And so these are really nice to have on hand for preparing the brain at the beginning of the day, for brain breaks, even for transitions. Um, for fitness and exercise, if you were going to do a whole activity where maybe you did this, you know, you rolled the dice 10 to 15 times for those brain breaks or preparing the brain, you might only roll them once or twice just to kind of get them ready and get them in the mood for learning. Um, you could also easily use this for reviewing content and teaching content, depending on what you're doing. So maybe while you're doing the addition problem, you're twisting your foot. Um, or while you are reciting the alphabet or specific letters of the alphabet and their sound, you're doing whatever the movement with that body part is. And this activity was specific to an elementary school physical education class. So they had to tell their partner something they did well in phys ed, they had to ask a question, and they had to give their partner a positive suggestion. Um, but this could easily be adapted to our younger classroom as well. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we were really meeting the needs of anyone who could possibly be looking for movement ideas. And I thought this was really great. You could also incorporate this into just a, your typical elementary school classroom with different lessons, especially for reviewing content and class cohesion, because it's going to help develop that respect for each other. Um, and that support of each other. And while this source is from toddler approved, really this could be used with a lot of different age groups. I was even thinking early elementary school, while it seems so, um, it seems like it's such a young activity, the children are going to have fun with it. And by the end, especially if you're looking for something for class cohesion, it, they're all going to be giggling and having fun and getting along because it's just a silly activity. But at the same time, they're doing those movements. So they're preparing the brain. They can be used as a brain break. And they're just going to kind of get them into the mindset for learning. So these are just different animals. Um, so like this puppy one, it says a puppy wags his tail around the house. So the children have to do whatever is in bold print on the card. So they would wag their tail or the piglet squeals while walking around the room or the pen. So then they would squeal while walking. So you can see how you can incorporate this with a lot of different age groups, even though it says from it's from toddler approved. Um, this is another great resource for crossing the midline activities. 
And a lot of these could be incorporated across all age groups. Some of them you wouldn't even necessarily think about actually promoting how to cross the midline to prepare the brain, like washing the car. Um, and you could do imaginary activities with these as well. They don't necessarily have to be exactly what's on there. So washing the car, you could just do imagine you're washing the car and you're doing those motions across the midline. Painting with a large paint roller, that's something that you could set up outside. They could paint with water with paint rollers. Um, even in the classroom, if you had an area where you could do that, it doesn't necessarily even have to be with water. They could just do it on a wall with a dry brush to practice that skill and to get the, the two sides of the brain connecting. And you could do these with a lot of the, of the movement purposes. Um, everything except teaching content, I felt like you would be able to incorporate this with. And how many of you set up obstacle courses or relays for your students? When I was in the preschool classroom, I did this all the time, especially in the winter months, um, being in Northeast PA and Head Start, there were certain times we just couldn't go outside, unfortunately, it was just too cold. Or if I had children who weren't prepared for the day, um, I can't take them the whole, the rest of the class outside. So in that case, my assistant and I would set up these elaborate obstacle courses. I was very lucky to have a very large classroom. Um, so we were able to set up quite elaborate obstacle courses and relays for the children. But I've even seen recently on social media where um, elementary schools have actually painted obstacle courses or movement courses into their hallways. And I absolutely love that idea not only so that the children and their teachers could do them together as they're walking down the hall, but maybe you have a child who just is really fidgety and having a difficult time focusing, or they need a minute to themselves, that could be a really great way to get them moving so that their brain is preparing to come back to the classroom and learn, but also just naturally helping them calm down and soothe themselves by moving. So definitely don't be afraid. I know in elementary schools, it's a little bit more difficult um, because you're a little bit limited by space um, and sometimes by the school's regulations. But I think if you were to have that open conversation with your principal um, or whoever was supervising you and just let them know what you wanted to do, that you would be able to incorporate something at some point, maybe not every single day, but definitely sometimes. And then this one, um, this is really great for like my third grader has been learning uh, place values. And so we actually did this activity. She absolutely loved it um, because it's getting them moving and they're slapping those place values. But I also adapted this because I have three different children and three different age groups um, for my youngest learner for identifying his numbers. And then for my kindergartner, when we were practicing addition skills. So there are a lot of different ways you could use this. I thought this would be most effective for the purposes of reviewing content, but also teaching content. So it just makes it more fun and engaging and they're moving while they're learning. I know for my own children, this is much more effective. Um, and I think for a lot of children it is, but it just makes that review and learning process more fun. Um, I also loved this idea. Um, stretchy bands. And I never used these in my classroom, but I, now I wish I did. But um, this particular source was talking about creating different shapes out of the stretchy bands. I like that you could use this for class cohesion as well if you had larger stretchy bands um, and you wanted the children to make bigger shapes like rectangles or squares. Maybe they could work together to create those. Um, even circles, those are a little bit difficult on your own sometimes, so they can work together. But also to just use stretchy bands for the purpose of stretching and preparing your body. You can cross the midline with these. Um, and also just kind of letting the children explore with them as a movement activity or a brain break. How would you use that stretchy band? And I always love to see what the children come up with because a lot of times they're a lot more creative than we are. Um, and then this one, this is also on Teachers Pay Teachers. I believe this one was free though, but it has a lot of kinesthetic activities for sight words and spelling. 
um, which is always helpful. I know for my own child, he really, really struggled with sight words in kindergarten. In context, he could read them great, but to sit down with a sheet of words that your teacher provides to you, or I created flashcards with them so we could play some games with them, um, it was very difficult. It's difficult for him to focus. And I think for a lot of our kindergartners and first graders who are learning all those sight words right off the bat, that is very difficult. And so if you can make it more fun and engaging by moving, that is really, really helpful. And this had 60 different activities um, and cards that you could use, which makes it so much more fun for them. And then this one as well, Brain Break Activity Movement Cards and Printables. Some of these were free, some of them you had to pay for. Um, but what I like is again, like the ones I showed you earlier, is you don't necessarily have to purchase them. Purchasing them is really convenient and easy if you have that ability, because then all you have to do is print them, laminate them, and you have them ready as a resource. But you could just go through here and see what types of movements. Maybe you're struggling to think of different movements. You've developed your own cards, um, but you feel like you're doing the same movements over and over again. That's what I like to use these resources for is what am I missing? What am I not thinking of? And so I might look through these activity cards and figure out what I haven't thought of yet and then be able to incorporate those into what I've developed myself. Um, this one, the Easter egg toss math game. So it doesn't have to be around math, around Easter, um, but this is a, an awesome activity. And I'll actually share that I did this with my own two children, my four-year-old and my seven-year-old. Um, for my seven-year-old, when he was working on addition up to 10, so I um, did use some more, some more cups there. I had up to 10 um, and I had numbers and he had to toss two eggs and then add those two numbers together. Then for my four-year-old um, practicing his number identification, we did one through 20 and he would toss the egg and then tell us what the number was. And they play this all the time on their own still because it's a lot of fun, they're learning, but what they like is that it's a game and they're moving. We're not just sitting down to do a worksheet or to do math on a right and white board or something like that. We're doing it in a fun, engaging way. Um, this one too, this is a great one for the planets. Uh, if that's something that you're going to be incorporating into your lessons, this one is actually recommended for fourth grade students if you go to this resource. But I always did a unit on space and the planets and I felt like you could easily adapt this activity to your preschoolers, allowing them to be the planets and see the positions from the sun. You would obviously have to place them into those positions or have markers for them, but it's going to give them that, that visual while also being physical and it's going to help them better remember that information. Um, the gallery walk, how to run a gallery walk. I would highly recommend that you read this blog post on using a gallery walk to teach content because this can be as simple as teaching the steps to a specific routine, which we do all the time in early childhood education. So I thought that was really interesting, but it can also easily be adaptable to the age groups we're all working with. And it's such a great strategy for getting the children moving while learning. Um, this one I've also used, so I've tested out a lot of these for you and I can tell you that they are wonderful. We actually um, purchased this poster, I forget where I purchased it, somewhere online, printed it, laminated it, and my kids absolutely love to do yoga. Um, if you are aware or if you're familiar with Cosmic Kids Yoga on YouTube, that can be a great resource and tool to prepare the brain or for brain breaks or fitness and exercise. Um, I know a lot of schools are using it now too. It's a wonderful resource for young children, but even something as simple as this yoga poster, you could have this on your wall. And if you're going to take, let's say one to two minutes to do a couple of yoga poses, maybe you pick two to three children to choose their favorite letter, and then everyone's going to do that pose. Or you could go through the alphabet. If you're teaching the alphabet or reviewing the alphabet, you could also use it in that way. And I didn't actually write that down, 
but those are great ways to use it as well. So this can be really adaptable to everything that you're working on and you can use it in a variety of ways, which I always like about resources. Um, focus. We know that for a lot of our children, um, focus can be really hard. For most of our children, their attention spans are very short, which we plan for um, and we are aware of. But sometimes they just are having a difficult time, especially around, let's say, like holidays or birthdays or special events that are coming up in school. They're just going to have a more difficult time focusing. Um, even as an adult, sometimes I'm having a difficult time focusing. I just have too much on my mind. But these are 18 quick exercises. So you could do these in one to two minutes to prepare the brain as brain breaks for fitness and exercise or those times that you just need them to get in a focused mindset to learn a new concept, especially around things like holidays or special events that might be coming up that they're really excited for. And so therefore they affect their focus. And if you're looking for activities for class cohesion, um, the, this source has lots of great ideas, but what I loved about these is while they promote class cohesion, you can also incorporate them into other purposes of movement. So brain breaks, fitness and exercise, or even just to review your content. And so I do encourage everybody to connect with me. Like I said, um, on, on Pinterest, if you search Sarah Jewell, you'll see me come up. Um, I will send you the link to my Pinterest in the contacts. You can also always email me if you have other ideas or you're having trouble finding me on Pinterest. You can always email me at sons.ece at gmail.com. I love to connect with everyone. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out if you have anything to share or you have any questions for me. Sarah, as always, amazing. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording right now.